See Hello, you. everyone. Welcome to session 86, I believe, <laughs> I hope, of uh, Libraries in Response, uh, a, a program we initiated uh, four years ago with the, the start of the pandemic and have been rolling since. So uh, welcome back or welcome for the first time to our little corner of this hello world. That should be up. Uh, 85, my error. Uh, so uh, this is a this is a a follow-on session. <clears throat> Getting Telehealthier at the Library Part 2. We Last week, we had a really lively session that was very difficult to conclude because there was just so much to talk about and, and so much interesting, interesting information that we were receiving from our presenters that we decided we would just extend it by having another, another session on this growing service, I guess we can call it, is uh, telehealth at the, at the library. Uh, it's... It's complicated and it's also pretty straightforward. It just depends on uh, all of the different elements we'll hear uh, quite a bit about. We have um, we have Pamela and Karen uh, presenting today. We'll we'll introduce them when we get started. Oops. All right. seems to be kind of balking on me. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we're an open consortium of, of libraries anywhere that are doing interesting things, leveraging technology to enhance or even reinvent services. <clears throat> Started in 2007 with uh, Fiber to the Library Initiative, saying that this is the smartest, quickest, most economical, most equitable way to deliver next generation broadband in every community is to connect all the, in the US, 17,000 facilities with uh, gigabit fiber. We're still working on that, but it made the, it's, the country's made a lot of progress on that, just not quite enough. And today's session will make that point. Again, we are hosted and recorded by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions which is the Global Consortium of National Libraries and National Libraries Associations, a longtime partner with Gigabit Libraries doing this since the beginning and also on our work uh, for public access. We think everyone everywhere should have proximity to public access to, to the internet uh, within walking distance, let's say. And there's still 3 billion people that lack that. So there's always more to do, of course. Our sponsor is uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, coming in to support the series this year. We appreciate it. Uh, our image, I don't know how many recognize uh, Rosie the Riveter, but she was an icon of uh, World War II and uh, the challenge of keeping up with all the production uh, demands of the world war and women were suddenly, you know, out of the house and into the factory. And it was, uh, it was a big deal. So uh, the, the, the state library in Texas adopted this symbol and used it for their telehealth uh, campaign. It's pretty cool. Uh, and Henry Stokes was the one who used the art and created the art for that. Well, our focus for this series has been on libraries as responders, responding to, of course, the health crisis uh, from 2020, and then it just rolled one after another, or there was in the, the uh, social crisis from the Floyd murder, then there was the economic crisis, and we had a political crisis, uh, and of course, the ever, ever present and pervasive and growing climate crisis. So libraries are challenged. Uh, when there's a connectivity 
crisis, you could say, uh, shortcomings. But whenever people are in need, they turn to the library. And, you know, so like it or not, libraries have to respond, or they do respond. They tend to never say no, and that creates challenges. Uh, here's a kind of a uh, encapsulation. This is our kind of our gathering all together the various things. These are these are not all new, but the intensity is at a new level. Uh, AI has come on the scene as a challenge, a crisis, we could say, on what does it all mean? What does it mean to libraries? What does it mean to patrons? What does it mean to everybody? It's a big question, and we're we're focusing a lot on this. The pandemic, of course, we've had them, but not as intense as uh, COVID. COVID just snapped the entire world. I mean, all of civilization turned on a dime in response to this, this health threat. Never seen anything happen so quickly. We're still, the, the re repercussions are still reverberating through society. Uh, a lot of issues are coming out of it. And of course, the climate change is not new, but it really is starting to make itself known in very visible ways. And war, we didn't think was a, a global event, but looks like, you know, here it is again. Uh, and here's the poor world wishing for the good old days of mere nuclear annihilation. Well, um, just imagine a world wrapped with a, a network of connected libraries that are all collaborating and dealing with all of these as a way to strengthen this, uh, this social response to these challenges. Uh, to our point, to our to our topic today on telehealth, <clears throat> about one in three U.S. practicing physicians are primary care, but only one in five are, have completed their residency two years later. Uh, the cost is something that is just really amazing that it that it costs so much to to get an education in in a degree in medicine or law would be similar. It makes it very difficult for uh, professionals to go anywhere but uh, cities to get to make enough to to pay off uh, their loans, which they all apparently seem to have a uh, huge amount. Uh, this is to the point on connectivity that how many people, and especially rural Americans, lack minimum access. The, the FCC broadband definition is 100 megabits and 10 megabits up. But this one, 25 megabits is minimum to do, <clears throat> pardon me, to do uh, streaming video. Uh, so that's critical. Another reason that people will come to libraries because, you know, so many people in rural parts of the country and in the urban parts just lack adequate connectivity to you may take advantage of useful service. Um, this is a, uh, a breakdown of, you know, the, the population is roughly uh, four to one urban to rural. And uh, you can see the physician ratio is nearly three to one. Uh, and it's just not enough. The, the cost, we, we made this point last time, this will be the last slide, uh, that the savings of uh, te uh, telehealth compared to, you know, in office visit is uh, huge, you know, this, you know, $100, $200 for a visit for the patients and larger than for the whole system, the, the providers are saving. It just seems to be a very efficient way to supplement in-person care. And uh, this is a, the, the most famous medical journal, JAMA, uh, came out with this just earlier this month. And so the point being, what's the contribution that libraries are making to this overall cost structure? Recall that health represents 17% of the national economy. It's a, that's an enormous, just mind boggling number. And to the extent that libraries and telehealth in general are helping reduce that, it's significant. If it if it were if it were one hundredth of one percent, it would be hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's another case where libraries are are providing super valuable services 
without adequate recognition, much less recompense. So uh, this is a great source of, of uh, resources and training. National Library of Medicine, uh, they do ongoing trainings. They'll, they'll schedule one-on-one. -on -one. This is a main source, it looks like to me, for uh, telehealth information and support. Our current presenter is notwithstanding, of course, and uh, Pamela is uh, Pamela Guzman, nurse scientist, UVA, and also representing the national organization that she's going to tell us about today. And Karen Perry, manager for uh, information services at New Jersey's uh, East Brunswick Public Library. Uh, was with us last week and has again returned, thankfully, to extend her remarks, uh, which just due to lack of time, we had to foreclose last week. Pamela's with us for the first time, and we're just happy as can be to have you both. And so I am going to stop and welcome you both officially here and uh, ask Pam to tell us about her work. All right. Welcome, Pam. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see you all. I'm really glad to be here and especially um, want to call out. I saw that my uh, very dear uh, friend and collaborator, Zach Ward, is on the call. Um, so I'm going to be highlighting actually some of the work that he and I have done together with the Indiana Rural Health Association. Um, as, uh, first of all, you should call me Pam. Only my mom calls me Pamela and only when I'm in trouble. So, um, <laughs> please just call me Pam. Um, I am the nurse scientist at UVA Health in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm also an associate professor at the UVA School of Nursing and have been over there for about 10 years. And I have a program of research in, um, implementing telemedicine in, libraries, and I'm one of the co-founders of the National Telehealth Working Group, which some of you have also probably been on that um, from the beginning, uh, but you may remember Nick Martin from Delaware originally started that, and then when he went off, he's, he was actually like me, not a librarian, but was just interested in, his interest was in the um, technology side, and he went off to co-found Carbon Reform, which was his true sort of passion, and left the work of the the working group with me and George Strawley. Um, and so at this point, I'm stepped in and I'm taking over that group. We have a LinkedIn um, page now. I'm very excited. I'd love to have you all connect if you're not already connected, um, but it is really, so I look for more about that as we go forward. Right now, it's just kind of a loose collection of people that are interested, but I'm hoping to form it more into an actual official sort of group with some some more structure to it. So I'm really looking for uh, people who are continu continue to have interest in that. Um, I wanna thank Don for that amazing, I, I'm taking all these notes because some of the stuff that you have is actually more updated than what I have. And I may reach out to you, Don, for some of your um, citations, but that was such a great introduction to why this is incredibly needed. I'm a nurse, I come at it from the healthcare side where we have rural patients um, who this is, telemedicine is supposed to be for them, but it doesn't always work in their homes. And in fact, most of the time uh, it doesn't for people that are low income, that are um, older, and that's who tends to be in this country sicker um, and more in need of these services. So just a real brief, I'm sure you've had this before, but I just like to level set around definitions. When we talk about telemedicine, we're actually talking about a subset of telehealth. It's totally fine to use these terms interchangeably. Frankly, everybody does. But the sort of um, established definition is that telemedicine really just refers to an in-person visit that is delivered virtually. So it actually can be a phone call because that's um, delivered virtually, or it can be a video chat, which is what we typically think of as telemedicine, sort of that video, virtual video care um, that is has been shown to be just as effective as in-person visits for a lot of things. Um, and as Don has mentioned, type, telemedicine in libraries is really needed because they have the space in less space in some places, but they do have usually a space somewhere. Sometimes it's the director's office, but 
more importantly, or just as importantly, is they are experts in information and connecting people with information, as you all know, and they can help overcome those sort of broadband connection um, uh, barriers. And sometimes they can be the only public computer and the internet access for some of these underserved populations. We know this. They reduce these geographic and transportation barriers, particularly in my interest is in specialty care, because at University of Virginia, we provide specialty and subspecialty care. And we have people from all over the state coming here that sometimes have to drive four five and six hours. And I'm sure in places like Wyoming and Idaho, it is much more than that. Um, the other thing is it can serve an alternative when the home environment is unsuitable. So people may be able to do telemedicine from their house, but what if you're somebody who perhaps is like somebody who's in an unsafe environment, uh, maybe due to interpersonal violence, if they do it at the library, they can still have that private visit without worrying about somebody overhearing. Now, what's the problem? The implementation of successful programs is slow. We had a big, uh, large number around COVID because the need was so high, but not all those programs have been successful. And we define success as what are the number of people you're serving and are you serving the people that you know need the service? So I'm gonna share a little bit of our research findings. I apologize, I'm gonna go through these briefly. Part of that is time constraints, but part of that is some people may have heard some of this before. Um, but one of our first papers that we did where we talked to rural librarians and we found a couple things. One, their major priorities fell into two buckets. One, connecting historically marginalized populations with services and two, ensuring privacy. And I'm gonna ask you to remember that privacy piece because we're gonna come back to it later. The other thing we found were, again, this is going to be no surprise to you, but barriers to adoption of telemedicine. The number one is resources, money, and space. A lot of these libraries operate on a shoestring, particularly in rural areas, and they sometimes have to raise all their own money. But also, they're not sure how to connect with populations in need, and so they have some trouble sort of getting the word out and getting connected to those communities. Um, because I'm a, a researcher and a PhD, I got to throw in a little theory. And this comes from uh, Everett Rogers' theory, diffusion of innovations. I would be shocked if you hadn't seen this before. I feel like everyone has seen this, um, this uh, bell curve about the speed of, of adoption of innovation or adoption of technology. In this case, technology refers to anything new, anything novel, the environment. And on the y-axis, sorry, on the um, the x-axis here, we have the speed. So the people at the left adopt very quickly. Those are our innovators and early adopters. And of course, later is laggards. And sometimes you ultimately have refusers that never adopt it. We are still in this innovator and early adopter phase, but we did a study of the first innovators and early adopters. And the reason we did that and got that paper out was to be able to let people know, that, because these people are less risk averse, but then they can inform all of these people here because they're taking on the risk, they're taking on the, the financial and the time investment on behalf of everyone else. So what I do is try to publish what they're finding so that we can spur more and more adoption. If once we get over this 50% mark, it becomes much easier to get these programs in place across the country. But be, um, be, be aware, we are not there yet. We are still way on the left side of this curve. So one of the things I did about that is I published an, a research agenda. There's a field of science called implementation science and there are research um, frameworks and I used one of them to create a research agenda to just say what are all the things we need to know to study from a scientific standpoint to be able to spur this on and get this implemented nationwide. I am not going to bore you with the details of that. It's published in Public Library Quarterly. I'm happy to speak about it in more in depth. But basically, I just show this to say, since I published this, I've been stepping through the research on this. And even with the research, we're a little bit behind because we don't have research about patients yet. All we know is about libraries and a little bit about healthcare providers. So one of our studies, as I mentioned, was studying these very first adopters. These are the people that adopted during the initial phases of COVID. We studied um, areas, five areas across the country, five systems or individual libraries. 
And we basically found that there are a couple of different models, um, a few different models. We organized them and, and looked at them in terms of how successful they were. So one of the ways we, we sort of classified these models is how are they providing access to the telemedicine? Some of them just provided the access through the library. And here I'm talking about how do they make an appointment? And this meant patients in these programs made an appointment by going to the library. I know a lot of libraries now have scheduling online where you can go and you can schedule your time. Delaware had that. You can just go right to the library directly. Some of the programs only let you schedule it through a provider. So I'm going to my provider and I'm saying, I really wanna do telemedicine, but I can't. And they say, great. We work through the New Brunswick Library or whatever library. We can help you get that scheduled. That's provider access. Most of them or several of them fell into this category of hybrid, not all of them. Some were one or the other, which meant you can do it through your provider, but you could also do it through the library directly. The other way we classified these models was to, to the degree of how coordinated they were with an agency, a provider, um, uh, some type of community agency. And for this, think about, there were some programs that literally just threw their doors open and said, we now have telemedicine at the library, but there was no coordination with an agency to say like, who do we need to serve? Do we need to serve a certain population um, or a provider group that said, can you send your patients through here? So let me show you our findings around that. So this is just a matrix. And on this side of the matrix, this axis, we have the coordination that either minimally coordinated or highly coordinated. And then the type of access, library only, provider only, and hybrid. And what we came up with was that there were three models that existed at this time. One was, this was sort of the throw your doors open to the world model, which is it's you make the appointment through the library. It's really minimally coordinated. The library is just saying, we will do this, we're happy to do this, we're gonna help you, but there wasn't a lot of coordination or, or even advertising or marketing through other agencies and no development through other agencies. These two, and I've got this one in red because it was only one of these and it was urban, the others are green because they were predominantly rural. This was a provider only model. There was one at the time in Ohio where they said, people cannot get to their mental health appointments um, because they don't have access. And this was actually in an urban area because all the clinics had closed during COVID. And they said, we are going to be the provider for those. We're going to let people do it here. Even though the library was actually closed, people were able to schedule through the provider and do their telemedicine at the library if they didn't have it at home. The vast majority, and I believe today, fall into this category where they are um, or the ones that aren't this model one or, or this model three is they're hybrid. You can schedule through the library, you can schedule through a provider, they're coordinated with a provider or an agency. And that's where we saw most of it. Now, what was interesting is I talked earlier about success. These two, whether they're provider only or hybrid, once they're coordinated, those are the successful ones. We talked to a couple of these programs that were minimally coordinated, library only, and one of them had been open for a year and said, we haven't had one person come in. And we've seen that since anecdotally as well. And so you all may have more updated information than I do about that, but that was our research at the time. These are the successful programs that were connecting with um, historically marginalized populations and getting people in. So the next study we did was I said, okay, we're not getting people in. We need to know what healthcare providers think about this. And so we, we did a mixed method study looking at, we did a, a survey of 50 providers, physicians and nurse practitioners. And then we followed up with interviews with 12 nurse practitioners. I've got the citation. That's actually an old citation. It's been published since then. If anybody wants these studies, I'm happy to send them to you. Um, just a couple of main findings, we asked them, would you be open to your patients using telehealth services from a local library? And overwhelmingly, they said yes. So that was good. Not super surprising, but like no one knew before if this was even going to be on their radar screen. And then we asked them, what type of services could you deliver to patients using telehealth at a library? And we saw that almost all the physicians said they would see using it for health promotion, education and chronic illness management. It's that chronic illness management piece that is so 
important because that has to do with health promotion and education. That kind of encapsulates the whole thing. When you think about people in these areas that have diabetes, hypertension, you know, heart failure, and they need that ongoing education, but they they just need like, how's it going? Do we need to tweak your meds? Do we need to like get you in touch with, you know, other services? You don't need to be in person for any of that. And yet that's a huge number of people in this country that have those needs. And then the other thing we asked about is, well, what barriers do you see to doing this? And two thirds of them said confidentiality. This is why I asked you to remember about, we talked to librarians and we saw that their number one priority was, was um, privacy privacy and confidentiality. And as librarians, you know this. I was surprised as a provider interviewing librarians that they said privacy, 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 because I just didn't know at that time the library world. Now I know it better and I get it. Like I understand. But the problem is, one of the problems is the providers clearly do not know that librarians have that as a priority and that the programs ensure privacy. They think, you know, you're just sort of out in the world, in, in, in the main room doing this. So when we have these partnerships to have a, a program where we're coordinated with providers, we I saw that we really need to educate them. We've got to educate them that there's connectivity at the library, that there's privacy and confidentiality, and that there's technology support. Because some of the other things they said was, well, I don't know if my patients would know how to do this. But this is exactly what library programs provide. But the providers don't, the healthcare providers don't know that. And so I, I love this quote from Diane um, Connery. She said, we are always fighting nostalgia at the library. It's like people think of us as this top picture when really this is the modern library today is connected. It is not just the place to get your books. So with all of that in mind, I collaborated with uh, the Indiana Rural Health Association, Kasha, Kasha um, J. Jack and um, Zach Ward, who's here from the University of Southern um, Indiana. And we created a workbook to help promote these ideas of partnerships and collaborations. And I believe that Michelle has sent this out to you to take a look at. Um, I actually have the final version. I didn't, but it's very close to the one you have, but you can, um, so feel free to, to share that or I can resend the very final one. This workbook, we spent about, gosh, over a year putting this together. We got a lot of information from the National Work Group of Telemedicine and Libraries and other collaborators. And this tells you, it essentially takes that research and distills it down to action. How do I now use this to step through and develop my program? And we've actually had feedback from some people before they've had the workbook who said, I really wish I had this on the front end because they did the sort of less successful version. They got grant money for it and then it didn't really uh, get anybody coming in. Um, so basically what the contents, you've probably seen it at this point, it directs the users to set up the, that most pertinent type of program, that coordinated program that is going to work for their community. So we teach them, here's a way to evaluate what are the unmet health needs in your community. Because as a librarian, you may have know some of that, but you may not know all of it. And so this way you can get information from the community. It allows you to step through evaluating what are the providers that serve the area, not necessarily just the primary care providers, but who are like the, the UVA, the regional health systems that are serving patients but may not have a presence there, but you know that people are going to those visits and having to travel hours and hours, or in the case of more urban areas, um, you know, it can be just people having difficulty with transportation. It doesn't have to be because they're in a rural area. You can be transportationally challenged in an urban and suburban area as well. And it guides librarians through the development of partnerships. So I've just given you a ton of information. I promised not to talk too long. I did want to save some time for questions. And I unfortunately have a hard stop at about five minutes to 12. And I want to give Karen lots of time for her stuff. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know if you want to do any question or discussion now, but um, or we can wait. It's totally up to Don and the group, but I'm just going to put all that out there for um, for your for your uh, information and knowledge. That is great, Pam. 
I, I do have some questions myself, and I, maybe uh, others do as well. Uh, raise your hand if you do. <laughs> uh, you, you, you focus on a key, uh, a key point uh, that I would describe as trust, or has been described as trust. So, yes, I'm worried about privacy and confidentiality. Do I trust the library can provide that? And that was one of the things that I think we heard last week was surprisingly, even though we think of libraries as probably one of the most trusted institutions we have, still people wonder or maybe they have anxiety about that. So uh, is there a is there a, a cure for that? Is there a, a way to convince people in a in a programmatic way that that libraries are trustworthy in, in terms of privacy and confidentiality and capability? Yeah, so I can tell you the way um, the research shows that this is not in libraries particularly, but people trust their providers. They trust their healthcare providers. And that's one of the things we believe is why having a provider-driven model works is because if I'm a patient and, and, and actually, I see this when I recruit for research is like, if I sit, can say to a patient, your physician wants you to know about this research study that we're doing, the patient's usually going to sign up for it because versus me just coming in and saying, I'm doing this study. So if the, if I have the buy-in of the provider and I can tell them that, or even better, they can say, yeah, I think this could be a good study for you to be in. They're going to do it. And that's where we see it in healthcare is they trust the provider, whether that's a nurse practitioner, a nurse, a physician, or EMT, or whatever, whoever's providing that care, there's an enormous amount of trust, uh, particularly when somebody is getting, you know, getting like ongoing health care, and they have that relationship. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Uh, it's it's the world referrals already, right? Yes. Okay, I'm going to refer you to the dermatologist or whatever. I'm going to yeah. refer you to the library or, you know, our exactly. follow-up. Exactly. Exactly. So if they say, you know, we have this program, our scheduler can help you set get it set up, they're more likely to do it than just sort of walk into the library on their own. And again, that's that's that's, that's what we think yeah. is going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, we haven't tested that. We haven't talked to patients at all about this, but uh, there's actually a there is a study that has just been done that we're working on publishing, but it doesn't get into necessarily this whole piece of it, but it starts to scratch the surface of it. So I, I, it, it makes so much sense. Uh, actually, it makes more sense than that beyond just simply, why don't you try the library to being a, a, an active promotional relationship that, you know, to let people know about this in general, rather than just the patient in front of you. Uh, and it seems that the benefit to the provider are enormous. There, the cost savings to the patient is established. The cost savings, I think, to providers are also established to the point where it seems that they would be highly motivated to be an active partner rather than just a sort of consultative partner. Yeah. Is that take at all? And and would that translate into what kind of resources, physical resources, financial resources, what else? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I I realized early on is that because libraries lack resources, but yet they can demonstrate so much value with this kind of a program, I thought, well, a place like UVA, for example, and I'll just be honest, like, we actually don't do this. I've tried to get it going. I'm not sure why there's some resistance here. It's not, but I'm not, you know, but I do think in other places, there has been that investment in helping them get, you know, to set up satellite, you know, sort of stuff in the library, whether that's computers or, you know, whatever, because the, you know, if it costs $10,000 to do this, which I know some of these programs you can do for, you know, you may have to buy a kiosk or whatever, it may be less than that in some places, that's a huge amount of money for a small or rural library. But right. for a health system, that's like, a drop in the, I mean, that's like a drop in a drop in a bucket. You know, we're talking about drop some of these prices that's are great. billion dollar, you know, enterprises or half a billion dollar enterprises. On a drop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's great. Well, that's, that seemed like really a place to focus energy is to uh, amplify the potential of that relationship and the enormous advantages uh, uh, sitting there. There are questions about spaces 
I think we'll leave that and try to get to those at the end, you know, that the, what you touched on just now. And, and I think Karen has also something on that. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Karen now and welcome Karen back. Hi, Karen. Welcome hey, back. How are you? We're just going to get our, our slides up. Just give us a second. All right. Go right ahead. And uh, Pam, uh, feel free to post the link to the, to the group, the national group in the chat yeah i will and, do that but also i noticed we do not we are going to have a link to the workbook itself we don't have it yet we're waiting for um it's going to go on the indiana rural health association website that's where it's going to live permanently and we're going to tr probably try to get it on george Strawley's um his the uh, nnlm person in utah M many of you may know we don't have that yet i'll send out the updated or i can maybe even just put it in the chat so the updated right. workbook, but then once we get that out, um, we'll make sure that everyone has the link. Right. Once you feel like the organization is kind of stood up adequately, uh, you might consider uh, the Shelby Coalition. Are you aware of Shelby? They're well, very, since very- you mentioned it to me. No, I hadn't been prior to that, so. Oh, yeah. Well, they're very effective advocates for connectivity for uh, schools, health facilities and libraries. And uh, so it's just exactly uh, two of the three are what you need. And I'm sure schools are also definitely part of this, right? So, okay, uh, here we go. Karen, uh, okay. take it away. Welcome back. All right, everyone and can see my slide. So you should be in. Can. You're live. Great, okay, thank you so much um, for the introduction. And I'm honored to be back again this week to talk about how libraries are building healthy communities and to talk about our libraries program just for the health of it. This is um, unlike Pam who talked about the, um, the healthcare side. I am a librarian and I look at health and health from a literacy standpoint. Are people coming into the library, getting what they need, understanding, um, getting the grasp on barriers to um, Health, health information and people being able to understand and make changes in their behavior like language barriers, literacy, disabilities, those things that prevent someone from being able to um, understand information and advocate for their health. So let me introduce you to Just for the Health of It, our proprietary library program for health literacy developed at the East Brunswick Public Library back in 2009. Just a little bit about East Brunswick. We are a single branch library located in central New Jersey, right in the center of the state in Middlesex County, which is actually identified as one of the nation's top 20 most ethnically diverse uh, counties in the nation. We have people here from India, Egypt, Korea, Pakistan, and the Hispanic speaking countries. Interestingly, 45% of our residents speak a language other than English at home. There is no greater injustice than the right to be healthy. Just for the Health of It was created to address systemic racism, racism and discrimination in healthcare by reducing barriers to health equity. The program is centered on achieving justice in health so that everyone has an equal chance to live their healthiest life with understandable and actionable health information to make informed choices, and I always like to add, and to make changes in their healthcare behaviors. The program began back in 2009 with a change in demographics where we noticed that there, the librarians noticed there was a discernible change in the people that were coming up to the information desk. Staff observed a new wave of customers from different countries, as well as a, an influx of seniors uh, resulting from an, uh, a boom in senior housing developments. We noticed that uh, we had a lot of people, immigrants coming to the library asking for health information in a language literacy level that they could understand in English that they can understand or in their native language. And we had seniors uh, many educated, but didn't know how to use a computer or had barriers, uh, physical, visual, or cognitive barriers um, that prevented them from getting the health information they need. 
Right after that, in 2010, was the introduction of the Affordable Care Act by President Obama that made uh, health literacy or put health information uh, really at the forefront because patients, it was a, the Affordable Care Act really demanded a more patient-centered approach to health care and engagement so that people could really advocate for their health. So this November, our program will be turning 15 years old. Since then, we've helped thousands of people become empowered, engaged advocates of their health. Interestingly, these are the same people that use libraries every day. They're low income and poor. They tend to have lower education, el be elderly immigrants. English may not be their second language. People with physical and mental disabilities. And of course, everyone else, 36% um, of adults in the US have low health literacy, but everybody at some point in their life has a need for health information. So why does health literacy matter? It matters because people without it have longer hospitalizations and recoveries. They have poor quality life when living with a chronic condition. They use the emergency room more frequently for non-emergencies. They get diagnosed at a later stage of disease, don't go to the doctor for checkups, get cancer screenings, and, and um, avoid preventable conditions because they don't have health insurance. Many of them, especially immigrants, work shift work. They can't see a doctor during normal working hours. And of course, they have higher mortality overall. And from the hospital standpoint, um, they, they are a burden to the healthcare system, resulting in billions of dollars in withheld Medicare penalties because of uh, recidivism or readmissions to the hospitals within 30 days. So health literacy is a very important concern for, um, for society. So what is just for the health of it? Well, when I designed the program back in 2009, I wanted a simple program that would um, build a healthy community that was geared towards up what they call upstream, uh, as opposed to downstream in the emergency room or the doctor's office, upstream where re health, I always feel, really begins. The knowledge, the interventions, where you can really make an impact in um, changing behaviors and building healthy communities. I wanted something warm, a logo that was friendly, um, not scary. People get turned off and uh, they're afraid to ask a doctor a question. Something where we would um, be welcoming to the community so that people can turn to the library. So it's a simple program. It takes a four tier approach. We have a consumer, consumer health team. All of them are certified consumer health information specialists through the Medical Library Association um, in all areas of all life cycles of consumer health. They are a mobile team. They go out into the communities. We go to community fairs, farmers markets, senior centers, schools, support groups for various illnesses. We do health and wellness programs. We have 79 health and wellness partners in the community. We've done 87 programs in 2023, and um, our major partners are the four major hospital systems in our catch basin, which is Penn Medicine, happens at Meridian, Robert Wood, and St. Peter's. We work with doctors, dentists, physical therapists, chiropractors, uh, and holistic practitioners. We do health screenings at the library. So libraries are changing. We're doing a lot more. We do this for the benefit of many people in our in our town and surrounding towns that do not have health insurance. And again, we partner with our four major hospital systems to do this. We've done screenings for hearing, bone density, fall assessment, cholesterol, blood sugar, uh, blood pressure, stroke risk assessment, memory, uh, memory assessment, and we do about two screenings a month. And we have a health portal just for the health of it.org, which provides multilingual health information at a literacy, literacy level. Everything added is around an eighth grade literacy reading level because that has been determined the level at which most people, even highly educated, understand health information. I've heard uh, some information now that um, it may even actually be fifth grade level. So uh, we might want to make sure we provide health information at a level that people can use and understand. We also have a uh, submit a request button on our health portal that makes our portal extremely unique where our certified health specialists will do a custom health 
research um, project for you. If you say you get diagnosed with type two diabetes, you wanna learn what it is, um, make lifestyle changes, you want healthy recipes, they will put together a packet for you in a, uh, in a, a language that you can understand. We have done it uh, multiple times in different languages, as well as in a literacy level that librarians are trained um, when they go through their master's program to be able to understand and recommend information at the appropriate literacy reading level for people. And here's just some pictures. This is Suzanne out at a, a senior center. When we our librarians go out um, in the community, they put together uh, tables of health information that uh, uh, specifically um, for that uh, group that they're trying to reach at that event. It could be a senior center. In this case, it's a senior center where Suzanne's handing out information about safe exercises for seniors, nutrition, uh, safe medic, how to take their medication safely, how to prevent blood clots, depression, for, um, fall prevention. Oops. Here's uh, our consumer health librarian, Sono. She's at a Parkinson's uh, um, event for people that were uh, just diagnosed with Parkinson's or for their family members. Again, um, providing information about eating healthy with Parkinson's, the latest treatments, medications, exercises, uh, help, helping people to understand their condition. Uh, here's some lovely ladies at a school that we visited in the heart of New Brunswick, New Jersey. This was interestingly a school attended by um, immigrants, uh, mostly illegal immigrants from the Northern Triangle of Central America. Nobody spoke English. So Maritza on the right hand side is my bilingual speaking, Spanish speaking um, health librarian. And you can see her handing out um, health information. This particular focus of this school event was on healthy eating and nutrition for children. And you can see these uh, little girls holding up their coloring books about how to eat healthy. Here's Alina at a health outreach event we did for LGBTQ at our Crystal Springs pool this summer. So we were really out there uh, and she put together uh, a, a array of articles about LGBT, LGBTQ plus health, including um, we're gathering now a lot of information about providers. Uh, so when, we, when people turn to us, we're able to um, provide them best information. For the past uh, seven years, we've partnered with Astera Cancer Care. They are the largest private medical oncology group in New Jersey. Uh, we work with their medical oncologists. We do every three months, we do a program on a different type of cancer. We make our programs warm. We all offer them through Zoom so that they're taped, they're viewed um, internationally. We've had people as far away as Russia tune into these programs. The, uh, the medical oncologists do them over and over again. Uh, we know the docs really well. Um, they love doing it. Uh, and it's they provide every single program with a Q&A to answer people's questions. And these are some of the, these are just some of the programs that we've done with Astera Cancer Care. And you can see, we go really deep in the weeds. Like, and we tape them all and we put them out on our health portal. This past October, we were, we were really excited because we were the first library to be visited by the Screen NJ bus of the New Jersey Cancer Institute. Um, they came uh, for the full day. They provided skin cancer screenings, breast cancer screenings, and lung cancer screenings with their um, with their team, all free. Um, no no health insurance was required. And we were the first library to be able to offer this. It was a, a big thing. You can see that this actually, the bus, you can see how big the bus was in front of our library building in the back. Uh, it was, you know, it was kind of funny because, you know, I had to get work with the police department to bring this big bus in, but it was a lot of fun. We had every single slot booked for the entire day. And there's their team of, of um, medical um the medical team of nurse practitioners and physicians that were there with us for the entire day and you can see on the right hand side it was actual uh, um examination rooms just like the traveling doctor's office 
We work very, very closely with Rutgers Medical School. Um, we They do programs for us. We have about 22 students that work with the library. They use the library as part of what they call their DISC, their DISC program, Distinguished in Community Service. Uh, they use it, again, to apply for residency. It gives them um, extra um, accreditation. We um, we have students that do programs for us all year round and we in heart health, in children's health, mental health, uh, some of them are doing longitudinal studies that have been going on for years now. This particular group was pretty funny um, because they just got their white coats the day before. And where did they send them on their first stop? The library. They really want them to get out, uh, start talking to people, start getting comfortable with people. So the t our team of librarians put together um, some very, you know, it was a fun event. This was not like heavy, deep in the weeds on summer health. And we had um, things about pool safety and sunscreen use and eating fruits and vegetables and healthy recipes. And the medical students uh, were excited to put, one of them put their white coat on for the second time since their indoctrination day the day before. And they um, handed out and talked to their future patients. So that's been a wonderful uh, partnership. Like I said, we have 79 partners, but being close to a medical school and um, we've, we've, been to, we've been to the medical school several times where we've spoken to medical students about health literacy and why it matters to them as physicians. Here's our health portal, just for the health of it .org. Uh, You can look across the top. We have, um, it, we have a, a tab there for health topics. I actually sit on the um, planning committee of Healthier Middlesex, which is a consortium of our, our major hospital systems. Uh, I work on the CHIP, what's called the Community Health Improvement Plan. It's a um, strategic plan required by all nonprofit hospitals every three years. It's required by the Affordable Care Act, where they, they identify overarching health needs for the community. This is a um, health portal that is maintained by our librarians using Drupal software. They're all trained to add content, articles and content. Specifically, we focus under health topics on those overarching health priorities that are unique to Middlesex County catch basin of our four hospital systems. Uh, specifically, we focus on things like food insecurity, access to care, housing, addiction, substance abuse, diabetes, heart disease, mental health, diet and nutrition and chronic disease. You can see in the right hand corner, there's also a tab to submit a health question. And the librarians, again, like I said, will package the information for you. Last week, I talked about NJ Health Connect at your library. That was a partnership between East Brunswick Library and the New Jersey State Library, where we purchased uh, using ARPA money, American Rescue Plan money, we purchased 454 iPads for 151 libraries. We traveled around the state training librarians. We actually, my, my staff actually curated the, the, uh, each iPad. Uh, our, um, our IT department actually worked with us. We used Meraki software so that all of the apps were remotely managed so people could not add or delete apps. And we had apps um, for telehealth that linked to all major hospital systems throughout New Jersey. We had apps for getting health information in different languages, um, for getting health insurance, the covered, uh, Get Covered NJ, and our NJ Family Care, which is our Medicaid. We had uh, apps for COVID, crisis hotlines, teen health, LGBTQ, substance abuse, and then we had an, um, a folder, I'm sorry, folder for have a meeting, which um, linked to Zoom, WebEx, and Google Meet so that people, uh, we could put these in the, or libraries could put these in the hands of their patrons um, and either take them home or use them in the library. And it was a one-year grant um, where we had these, like, these um, 454 iPads out there. After the grant ended, libraries are allowed to keep the uh, iPads, and we are looking at phase two now, which Michelle touched on last week. We are where we are. Libraries that have these iPads are going to be using them for um, for telehealth, telehealth apps uh, in a partnership with the New Jersey Mental Health Association. So we're really excited about phase two of NJ Health Connect at your library. 
And in summary, uh, there is a role for libraries to play alongside healthcare providers in building healthy communities upstream where good health habits and interventions begin. And I think it's a real opportunity for libraries to shine. Um, like Don said at the very beginning, healthcare um, occupies a big part of our economy and uh, libraries are changing. We know their roles are changing. And there's, um, I appreciate everything Pam talked about, the um, telehealth, the possibilities are, are really endless. It's a great opportunities for, for libraries to really, um, really get a, a, a new vision in their communities by their funders. And, um, and I'm very excited that um, there's so much interest in libraries and telehealth now. So thank you very much. Very good. Very, very good. You, uh, we talked about partnership with the providers, but you just exploded the whole range of possible partners. Uh, the uh, the telehealth networks. These are their state telehealth networks, uh, regional telehealth networks that that have all these kinds of partnerships today. They may they seem like they'd be very attractive way to access a lot of potential partners because they're the medium of connectivity and they're very active here. Uh, uh, government agencies must be uh, a natural, you know, the, the, the county health department, the, the schools. Uh, it looks like we might lose Pam. And Pam, if we, if we are losing you, we want to thank you before you go or if you've gone uh for taking thank the you time so today. much i'm so sorry i have to leave a few minutes early no no it's fine it's just great terrific presentation and so we'll have the recording up here by tomorrow and people will be able to see this and and uh, find the yeah. link and join your uh organization which i think is a really great idea and a way i'm to also going to put my people. email address in the chat if anybody wants to chat offline i've always got you know some research going with something i'd love to you know people have um thoughts or ideas that they want to you know um discuss please reach out to okay. me terrific very thank good you all. thank you thank you See you again so the 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 thing that struck me really powerfully was uh, health information, you know, not the interview with the physician or the nurse so much as just information. When <clears throat> when you or a, a, someone close to you is diagnosed with an illness, you become an active student, you know, your diabetes. I mean, the whole range of, the, of uh, illnesses that are so technical and we have so little uh, knowledge of until, until we really need it. And then we become super active students. And so how do you do that? I mean, just go online, you start searching. Well, that's another reason to get, uh, I mean, this is more traditional library services, helping people find information about things they're interested in or need. Uh, schools also seem like a natural partner for outreach. I, I'm sure you've thought of all of these, but it just it was great. Um, you've had experience with the space design issues, I, I think, Karen. Uh, is there something you want to say about an approach to that or there are different? Uh, you're talking about like the confidentiality of part of it. Um, we, when we launched NJ Health Connect, we were concerned about the confidentiality part because when libraries engage in health, they are, they are hospital. We work close, like I said, we work closely with the hospital. We are definitely, you ha definitely have to be aware of the HIPAA regulations. So when we put these iPads out into the community and to the communities, the various 151 libraries, we told them either you have to, and they had to sign a memor memor memorandum of understanding, either you have to have a dedicated private space or you have to loan them out. And uh, some of the libraries um, preferred to loan them out. I think most of them did. I kind of like that approach uh, mm -hmm. The ones that didn't loan them out were because they had lending policies that wouldn't allow people, you know, we had to honor each library's specific lending policy. But I personally, Don, like, I, I like people to have access to health information in the privacy of their home if they can. And I know Delaware has tried having people come into 
libraries, and that's it's worth. I mean, their program was very successful. Um, but you know, we we took a different approach where we wanted people to we wanted to put the iPads out there. So just sixteen. I don't know. You know, I the problem with health information is that, and this is one of the barriers that I see is that not everybody is comfortable. Um, you know, asking a librarian for a private issue. And that's something we have to respect. Um, that's kind of, that's why I like telehealth in a private venue, whatever that might be. Very good. I, I that makes a lot of sense. And and we've seen there's a lot of precedent because libraries have been lending out the hotspots now for years. And so that's a, a pretty accepted uh, practice. Uh, and adding a tablet to that one that's preloaded with uh, the uh, the connectivity uh, required by a provider that makes a lot of sense. People would, of course, we'd all like to have all these services in the home. It's the point where the library backs up so many things that are missing, like connectivity or certain knowledge areas. So uh, yeah. there's not a one size fits all solution for sure. We are well, on the I hour. Say, here. Not is that yeah. with you know okay. with telehealth there's two parts of the equation there's the actual technology delivering mm -hmm. information and then there's the librarian part there's the actual literacy part are what people are getting what the doctor is telling them do they understand it and that's where mm -hmm. i want to put, put a plug in for the national network of libraries of medicine because they do the training for librarians it's all free i encourage all public librarians to take it because it really helps you develop the um, the knowledge to be able to find authoritative resources in all life cycle stages for health information, whether it's chronic disease, you know, healthy living, nutrition, exercise, uh, also multilingual health information. There's a huge need for that now for the people, librarians to be able to provide that. So again, you have the technology, you can couple the technology with those things that we tried to do with NJ Health Connect, like it did have links for multi health multilingual health information, but you got to remember there's also the health literacy aspect because people may turn to the librarian after they do their telehealth appointment. Great point. Great point. Um, I also got excited looking at these uh, medical students you had in, these freshly uh, minted uh, medical professionals. They all look pretty cheery to me in there, and uh, that was good. I think it's just a great idea, a great exposure a way to kind of meet a lot of people in a comparatively short amount of time and have a sense of, you know, the, the public. You know, how do you get exposure? How do you practice on the public without engaging with the public? So that looks like a really good, good idea. And you know, I guess you're lucky to have a, a institution close enough like that. But, I, you know, there are a lot of medical schools around that uh, may play that role. So very good. Uh, anyone... Any burning questions? We're running over a little bit here, but uh, it's not a TV show, so we're not a hard stop, but I think we are good with our regular programming here. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and, and joining this really important discussion. Uh, another super powerful service from the libraries that just keeps growing as do our challenges to keep growing and libraries stepping up to meet them. Uh, we hope to record, we plan the recording should be up by tomorrow. Uh, we have a special event planned for next week on state libraries and artificial intelligence. Uh, we'll be going out with that soon. Hope everybody can make that if it's an interest to you, of course. So with that, I'm going to, uh, close the recording and thank you all again and invite you back. Thank you. Thank you, Don.